Welcome, everyone, to episode 15 of Why Christians Should Keep the Law. And I want to jump right into Paul's epistle to the Romans, specifically chapter 2, verse 13. He says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Man, you want to talk about a, a, a radically controversial statement in, in our generation. I mean, this is a very potent, very intense, and may I say very unambiguous statement. Basically, Paul comes out of the gate and says, listen, if you're not going to be a doer of the law, you will never be justified. And if we understand Paul's terminology here of justification equating to salvation, well, then that takes this whole discussion to a whole nother level. It really does. In fact, it reverberates off of that discussion that Jesus had with that young rich man in Matthew 19, where he comes to him and said, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And yet Jesus' response is, you need to be a doer of the law. You need to keep the commandments. I mean, this is, in, in, in our generation of progressive Christianity, boy, is this a controversial idea. Well, I want to build upon this. I want to take you to the epistle of James. James is literally going to teach the identical concepts. So we're going to get a testimony of two here that the Apostle Paul just preached in um, chapter 2, uh, verse 13. So. Let's take a look at this. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Identical principle being taught. Or to be doers of the law, doers of the word. What I like that James does is he brings this element of deception to the table, alluding to the fact that there is deception involved in this subject in the subject of being a doer versus a hearer, suggesting to us that, you know, be careful because men could fall into a great delusion thinking, hey, me and Jesus, yeah, we're okay. My relationship with Christ, we're, I'm, I'm fine. I, I, I don't need to worry. I mean, it almost takes me, again, it, yeah, it does. It takes me back to the garden where Satan convinced Eve and she fell into a delusion. She fell into deception thinking, I can walk away from the commandments of God. I can walk away from his law and I'm going to be just fine. When the reality is, is no, you won't. And so James brings this element, this warning, don't fall into that deception. And we need warnings like this. Living in a corrupt and perverse generation, a generation that absolutely despises and hates the law of God. And I'm talking about not pagans, not heathens, not atheists. I'm talking about Christians. How scary is that thought? Now, moving on, James goes to say, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into Listen to this. The perfect law of liberty. And that term perfect is teleos. In, in the Greek, it means the complete. The complete law of liberty. Did you ever think that you would find in the New Testament the term law being used alongside of liberty? Now, I, I can tell you, growing up in a conservative Christian home, a very good home, and I grew up in a very wonderful church, I grew up in the Assemblies of God. And, um, you know, my perspective growing up in the church was the law was absolutely out to get me. It was only going to bring me to the depths of hell, and it was there to curse me. I never considered for a moment that the term law could ever be put side by side with liberty when I understood that the law was the antithesis to grace. And yet, in this incredible way, James brings these two terms together to walk in the law of liberty. 
And, and, you know, this is what the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 119, that I will walk at liberty, literally says this. Now, James goes on and says, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. We are talking about doing the work, walking in his law, walking in his commandments. This one will be blessed in what he does. And, and James is drawing right from the law itself. And in Deuteronomy 11, I set before you blessing and a curse, a blessing if you keep. That means you observe, you keep the commandments of God. Now, let me further build upon this discussion and take you to Romans chapter 3, verse 31. The apostle Paul says this, he says, do we then make void the law through faith? Now, I want you to take that in because here we're, we're, we're again confronted with another million dollar question like what we covered in Matthew 19, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, this is another million dollar question because now here we are post-resurrection. We're into the spreading of the gospel. The new covenant has been implemented. And Paul, in that context, asks, do we make void the law through faith? Okay, so we're talking about Christians receiving the grace of God. They put their faith and trust in Jesus so that they can have forgiveness of sins, so that they can have salvation and hope. And Paul is saying, what do you do in the context of grace, of faith? As a Christian believer, what do you do with the law? Do you make it void? And the answer is certainly not. Isn't that interesting? So this is further establishing that warning, that prophetic warning that Jesus gave when he said in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Again, Jesus knowing that, you know, Christians would fall into the deceptive trap of thinking, no, he, that's what he did. He came to abolish his work on the cross and his resurrection and his implementation of the new covenant is going to abolish the law so that Christians don't, don't have to worry about it. They don't have to subject themselves to the law. They don't have to keep the law. And here, Paul deals with the very context of being under grace, being in the, co the new covenant, being people of faith, putting their faith and hope in Jesus. And he brings the matter of the law. Do you destroy it? Do you cast it behind your back? Certainly not. But he's not even done. He says, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law in the Greek histemi. You stand on the law. We are called to establish the law. This is what we as believers are called to do. Man, isn't it mind-blowing that the devil could take this discussion to such a place to convince Christians that the law has nothing to say to them, that they don't need the law, that they should reject the law. Let me take you to Romans chapter 8. Listen to what Paul has to say. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. So the apostle Paul is bringing the mind of flesh. He says the mind of flesh is hatred against God. Now, when you start talking about a context where you fall into, that, where you could hate God, we better be paying attention. I don't want to be known as one who hates him. I mean, yet this is exactly what Paul has brought to the table. He's saying the carnal mind, the mind of flesh is enmity against God. Why? Because it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Did you just hear that? Paul literally says that those Christians that do not subject themselves to the law of God, that will not bend to his will for our lives, because that's what the law is. It is the will of God for our lives. If you do not do that, you are operating according to a carnal mind, which literally hates God. May the Lord have mercy on us. May it never be. May we never fall in to that deception, but hold fast to the truth, hold fast to the word, to be faithful servants of Jesus 
calling upon his holy name for salvation to the very end and uncompromising in our obedience to his law. The Lord bless you and keep you. 